Matthew chapter 9. We have been going through a series on how he prayed, how Jesus prayed. First week we were in Matthew chapter 6. We talked about the Lord's Prayer. What's a better name for it? The Disciples' Prayer. Some of you were right. The Disciples' Prayer. It was not really the Lord's Prayer. It's not something that we're supposed to be praying. The disciples did not say, teach us a prayer. The disciples said, teach us to pray. And this prayer is really Jesus' model prayer. It was a prayer he said, when you pray, pray like this. And he was teaching the disciples to pray. Now, you'll hear it. You'll hear people recite it. You'll hear uh, probably Awana kids get points for, or, or uh, badges for learning it. I mean, it's a great prayer to, to know. But it's not a prayer to be ritualized. Not, not a prayer to just be recited as, you know, from rogue memory. It has to have some meaning behind it. And so we talked about that. When we pray, here's how you pray. Then, last week we talked about unity. Jesus' prayer for unity, that we would all be unified. Interesting, here it is, his last prayer right there before this time where he's going to be betrayed. Remember, Judas had already walked out. And Jesus knew the time was about to happen. And he said, here it is, I'm going to teach you about unity. I'm going to pray. God, help them to experience the unity, the oneness that we have. In the difficult days when we can pray like that, wow, what a prayer. Well, today we move to the, the next one, and uh, this morning we're going to look at Jesus' prayer for laborers. Here he's saying, pray for harvesters, or pray for laborers, people to help us in collecting the harvest, gathering the harvest. Now, a lot of you know, I spent 14 years in South Carolina. I'm a native Floridian. How many native Floridians do we have in the room? A dozen? Okay, good. <laughs> Florida is a unique place. Not a lot of us around. Born down in Hialeah. Anybody else from Hialeah? All right. We've got one other. You speak Spanish. I don't. So you'll have to help me if we go down that way. But uh, now, understanding that, we're from all different parts, different places. We had a membership or partnership class this morning. In that uh, partnership class, we had, uh, I think there were eight adults in the room. And of the eight, we were from five different countries. And uh, very, very, very unique in the way, the way that uh, South Florida is. So imagine a guy from South Carolina, or a guy from Florida, moves to South Carolina. I learned a lot. While we were there, those 14 years, I learned a lot. Now, one of the things I learned was new vocabulary. And if any of our South Carolina friends are watching this morning, give me a little grace, okay? But here's what I learned. There's a phrase. The phrase is this. You good? Now, if you're from the South, you know that means a lot of different things. You good means uh, here you are, you're in line at McDonald's, everybody's got their money out, somebody looks at you and they go, you good? It means do you have enough money? Okay. And then they say, uh, you know, you crash your, your bicycle, something happens, and they come over and they go, you good? <laughs> or then a kid falls down and all of a sudden you're just wanting them to get back up and it's like, you're good. It's all in the voice inflection. It can mean so many different things. Uh, you go out to dinner, and you're, you're wondering, you know, did you get enough to eat? You good? It means, are you full? All these different things. No wonder the English language is so difficult. You good? We, we got this, right? Now, it can be, it, and, and I got a whole list. I mean, you good can mean a lot of different things. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You good? You know, it, it just means so many things. So I learned new vocabulary when I got to South Carolina. The, my favorite was this, bless your heart. <laughs> Where's Rita? Rita, bless your heart can mean a lot of things, can it? Some we can say in church, some we can't. But bless your heart can go a long way. Bless your heart, right? <laughs> now, I not only learned the vocabulary, but what else I learned was agriculture. Now, growing up here in South Florida, we'd go to the Miami-Dade Youth Fair, and we'd go to these places, and we'd see the displays, and that was good. I was good, okay? But we'd go to these things, and here's what I learned growing up in South Florida. Milk comes from the, comes from the store. Um, <laughs> eggs come from the store. I mean, you know, that, that was the extent of, of me and my farming skills, right? So I go to South Carolina, and I'll never forget, my wife and I were driving up there, and May have been on our first trip, 
And I'm looking out alongside the road, and I'm thinking, man, what a trashy place. Look at all the litter. I mean, we're used to these well-groomed streets and, you know, the HOAs and, and the cities that will find you if things aren't picked up and edged and cleaned. And we're driving along, and I mean, there is trash all along the roadside. I'm thinking, this. look at the litter. This is a mess. Jim, you'll appreciate this. My wife says, that's not litter. Do you know what it was? There's cotton. <laughs> They had just finished harvesting the cotton, and, and it was just blowing around everywhere. And I'm thinking, man, what a trashy place. Look at this stuff laying everywhere. And she's going, Gary, that is, that is not trash. That's cotton. And I went, oh, okay, maybe I won't say anything else. So here we are. We're, we're riding along, and I'm getting this education through the years, and here's what I learned. Man, that's a farming community. I did not grow up in a farming community. I grew up here in South Florida. Well, uh, I'm learning what soybeans are and what they look like and cotton and peaches. And so you're seeing all these things that are growing. And then you're seeing the seasons and the planting and how they're turning the soil and they're putting all these things in. They have the biggest machines to do this. It's not like it used to be where people are out there, you know, picking stuff. It was, man, they got these huge machines. And uh, these combines, these balers, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, harvesting the hay cutting it down and man they're bailing it and it's these big rolls or these these uh, bales and they're just coming out of the back end of these machines it's just amazing and I don't know you guys may you probably know uh, Brooke and, and Jonathan had the the Utz's daughter and son-in-law and if you ever see Jonathan's pictures man now he's a real farmer that's a real farmer and he's got the big machines and when you see that you realize there's an urgency not only is it cooler when they're using the machine. Not only is it quicker when they're using the machine, but you realize the urgency and the reason behind the machines. Because there is a small window to harvest. From the time that, that the things become ready and ripe, there's a small window to harvest. And if you don't get it in that window, you have wasted all the effort of whatever you've grown. That's it. It's no longer good and it's just, just wasted. So the point here is this, no matter how big the combines or whatever you're harvesting and all these things, we're getting new educations, I learned this, that the more people you have out there working in the field, the more laborers, the quicker the job gets done. So here's Jesus' lesson, Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be in verses 35 through 38 primarily, but remember, he's been walking, he's been healing, he's been preaching, he's been teaching, and and it says that he came to the point that as he saw this harvest of souls, that he was moved with compassion. It wasn't until he really saw the people, that's when the harvest of souls, and that's when the compassion. And what a challenge for us. So we're going to look at that this morning. If you're following along on the outline, the first point there is this, Jesus saw the need. Jesus saw the need. So to start the story, I'm going to back up in Matthew chapter 4 and work our way up here. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, it says this. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Notice there, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed epileptics and paralytics and he healed them great multitudes followed him from galilee and from decapolis jerusalem judea and beyond jordan that's starting back in matthew chapter 4 fast forward to matthew chapter 8 what do we see there i'm not going to read the whole passage but you find the healing of the centurion servant you find the healing of peter's mother-in-law he healed the sick cast out demons in that evening he calmed the stormy sea. He healed the two demon-possessed men. I mean, all this, just rapid fire. Boom, boom, boom. Jesus is with the people. He's out there seeing the needs. He's moved with compassion. His compassion resulted in a response. So when he sees the sick come, he heals them. When he sees the demon-possessed come, he delivers them. So 
he didn't just see it, he did something about it. Matthew chapter 9, it continues, he heals the paralyzed man. He calls Matthew, the tax collector, to be his disciple. He restores the life of the dead girl. He heals two blind men. He healed the mute man. Man, Jesus is busy. All this leading up to where we are in Matthew chapter 9. Now look at the verse. Verse 35. After all of that, seeing the people, being with the people, touching the people, healing the people, feeding the people, preaching to the people, teaching the people, it says, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages. He continued. He didn't stop. There was an urgency. What's the next word? Teaching in the synagogues. What's the next word? Preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So we've got five chapters wrapped up here to where all he's been doing is he is with the people. He is seeing the need. How can you see the need if you're not with the people? One of the challenges this morning, people in churches too often times so separate or segregate themselves from the unsaved world that we don't even see the needs. We build these communes to where we gather inside and it smells nice and it's neat and it's tidy and we don't get messed up with the world or the real issues or the real problems and we look at it and we say, how can this be happening? No, we, we got these little walls built. We don't see the needs of the people because we're not out there with the people. Jesus saw the need when he was with the people. And I want to challenge our church family. You're not going to see the need on this campus. If all we do is walk from building to building and we're in Sunday school class to life group, connect group, training area, teaching opportunity, fellowship opportunity, you're constantly around other believers. And yes, there are needs. Just because somebody's a Christ follower doesn't mean their, their world is perfect. But it's when you get off this campus and you get out into the workplace and you begin to compare your work, not compartmentalize, but compare, that here you are and you are a spiritual being on an earthly mission. Here you are. You're set here for such a time as this. And you begin to look around and you see people through Jesus' eyes. But all of a sudden, man, you start to feel their pain. It's no longer just, yeah, this is what they're going through. It's how can we help them? It's no longer the judgmental aspect of the church saying, look at them. It's, how can we help them? These people need help. They need healing. Jesus, when he saw the need, helped, and he healed, and he fed, and he encouraged, and he delivered. He didn't just say, let me pray for you and go the other way. And too often times in our neat and tidy Christian world of today, we just walk the other direction. But don't miss this. He taught, first thing. And there's a big difference between teaching and preaching. It says he was teaching in their synagogues. Now, teaching is instructing. Right? Anybody can be a teacher. You can teach academics. You can teach hygiene. You've got to teach little kids how to brush their teeth, how to wash. You've got to teach them all that stuff. Did you wash behind your ears? No, but that's something you need to do. You're teaching, okay? You teach auto mechanics. You teach uh, all these different things, whatever your career may be. Okay, you teach that. But teaching is to explain or clarify. It's, it's, it's to show how. And pre preachers are supposed to be apt to teach. It's one of our qualifications. But using the term pastor is really a biblical term. Preacher is the verb. We're, preacher is different than teacher. Teacher is how do we apply this? How do we take this? And how can we know it and use it? The word preach is to proclaim. It's, it's the one who is the proclaimer, making the proclamation. That's to announce, to herald a message. And that's not just the person that stands in the pulpit or holds the title pastor in the church. That's every single believer is called to preach the message. Say, but I'm not a preacher. I'm not either. I'm a pastor. The office is pastor. We talked about that in our, our group this morning. Bishop, elder, overseer, pastor, same office, different responsibilities. But preacher's not an office. That's what we do. Preacher is a, 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 a verb. It's the thing that we're actually taking action with. And everyone in this room that knows Jesus Christ is called to be a preacher, one who proclaims the gospel. So 
here we are. Jesus is instructing Peter to feed his sheep. Think about that. If all Peter did was uh, preach, proclaim the message over and over and over and over with no teaching, then it'd be a pretty malnourished or weak flock. So it takes people to teach and people to preach. But the Great Commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations. That word is the proclamation, making new believers, teaching them to observe all things. Teaching who? The new believers. So both are important. Taking people deeper in their faith, but bringing people to a point of faith. you got to have both. But all of us are on the team of preaching. All of us have to be out there proclaiming the good news. The good news is the gospel. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the multitudes, it resulted in action. I said, preacher, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know how to share the gospel. I don't know how to share my faith. I don't know how to talk to people about spiritual things. When you see, I mean really see, the need, you're no longer going to worry about, am I going to do it right? You're going to say, i got to do something. When we see people the way Jesus saw them, all of a sudden you have to do something. It's no longer about your presentation. It's about, I've got to help with their need. I've got to. Secondly, not only did he see the need, but he felt the need. He felt the need. Look at verse 36. He, again, saw the multitudes, and it had an immediate effect. The effect he was moved with compassion. Why? Because they were weary and scattered. In the NIV, it says they were harassed and helpless, like sheep having no shepherd. They needed somebody. They were, basically in the Greek, it's, it's this way. Troubled, they were beaten down, they were weary. <laughs> that describes today's church to a sense. But it also describes the world that we live in. <clears throat> Troubled, beaten down, and weary. We are in a point in culture where, where people are just weary. We're weary of the nonsense around us. We're weary of hearing all the trouble around us. We're weary of hearing about wars around the world. We're weary about hearing about the, the uh, economic issues. We're weary about hearing about inflation. We're, we're tired of the mess. We don't need to hear that anymore. We're weary. We're beat down with these things. So when it comes to spiritual conversations, people are welcoming those. The question is, will we have those? Are we preaching, proclaiming in a time where people need good news? Jesus saw the need, he felt the need. In the Latin, it means to suffer with. He had so much compassion that he began to literally, the way that we would say it is, is he was just running on, on that adrenaline. Man, he was tired. I took you from Matthew 4 to Matthew 9 and showed you what he was doing, rapid fire. He wasn't like on vacation or taking a rest or saying, hey guys, I'm tired. He said, no, there's an urgency. Let's keep going. He reminds me of a story and this, this idea of the felt need. Some of you remember the priest. I shared the illustration just a few months back, so I'm just going to give it to you in a couple sentences. That saw the need in a leper colony. And he went over and he began to share Jesus with that leper colony to minister to their needs. And ultimately, is the way the story goes, and a true story, by the way, he himself became a leper. He caught leprosy. Because he saw the need, and he did something about the need, not from a distance saying, you stay over there, but he said, what can I do to help? And he loved on the people literally to the point where he himself caught what they had, but he just wanted them to experience the love of Jesus. That's what we've got to do, get to this point where we're seeing people in their point of need. Our community, man, if, if, if Jesus were here in this community, you know what, how it would read? Probably read, he wept over the homeless. He wept over those that are being human uh, trafficked. He wept over those that were, were uh, beaten down with drug abuse and addiction. And he went out and he ministered. He just didn't say, wow, what would happen to that person? Hey, get a job. No, Jesus would have responded differently. He would have helped because he felt the need. So let me pause before we go to the next point. Have you seen the need? I mean, in our community, have you really seen the need? Because it, it's here. Have you felt the need? Have you, have you come to the point where you felt it to the point where you just say, I've got to do something about it? I've got to do something. Jesus put us here for such a time as this. Third thing, 
He met the need. He saw it. He felt it and was moved with compassion. And then he met the need. Look at verse 37. He said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know what that is? That's the opportunity. Jesus saw an opportunity. The harvest is plentiful. Laborers are few. Go back to the South Carolina illustration. Man, when it came harvest time and you saw those fields that were just literally full of cotton, there was plenty of opportunity. You drive by the, we had a place up there, McLeod Farms, and man, they had peach trees as far as you could see. And they were, when they were full, they were full. And you just think, wow, how are they going to gather all this stuff? And uh, you drive by, and there were people out there working. In fact, they had laborers. Some of those things you can't harvest with machines. And they would have so many laborers, they would bust them into the local Walmart on Friday night to buy their supplies. It was, they had it, it was literally on the side of the bus, the Pine Needle Express. And uh, they were bringing the laborers in so that they could get their supplies. The opportunity, man, the fields were white unto harvest. But Jesus also said, like the other farmers in verse 38, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Why? Because of the other word, the blank there on your sheet. It's urgency. There's an opportunity but there's also an urgency. In the field, it's going to rot. You buy bananas, you leave them on the counter, what happens to them in a couple of days? They get freckles, and then they turn brown, and then they're mushy, and, you know, some of you, my wife teaches VPK, so I'm, I'm speaking their language. They're mushy, all right? You go to peel it, and it just kind of squirts out the side, and you go, I, I don't want to eat this. There's a certain window of opportunity you buy an apple you leave it on the counter and what happens if you don't eat it soon enough that apple that was nice and hard and crisp is now soft and you don't want to bite into a soft apple that's that's terrible you get a nice orange same thing you know just you have a window of opportunity not only do you have a window of opportunity from the time you purchase it until the time you consume it But there's a window of opportunity between the time that it's ready on the vine and when it is picked. And if you miss the window of opportunity, it's wasted. Hey, church, we're in the window of opportunity. We're really there. I'm not a doomsday prophet. I don't try to predict the end times, all that stuff. No man knows the day or the hour. Okay, except God. That's it. I believe that. But I also believe that when you look at scriptures, and we did a study in Daniel, and you begin and you look through the book of Revelation, and you go through and you look at the events that are described, and you look at our world and and the way things are playing out, you just go, you know, man, I see a lot of similarities. They call good evil and evil good. I don't have to explain that to you, what's going on in our world, right? There's a day where they don't want right teaching anymore. They just want the tickling of the ears. People want to be affirmed in everything. Sin, you can't preach on it. It's hate speech. We're in that day. You realize that. And I could give you the illustrations of what's happening around our world. There's an urgency. You say, no, not really. Well, let me ask you this. I've got family here today. If I have family that don't know Christ as Savior... Am I good with the Lord coming back today? No, it's like I really want to go, but, but I don't want to go. And, and those that I love end up in eternity, in hell for eternity. I, I don't want that. I want them to know Jesus. Lord, give, give us a little more time, just a little more time. You have loved ones. Somebody else has loved ones. You've got neighbors, you've got friends that don't know Jesus, and the day, the clock is ticking right now. The day's coming. And if we don't think about this and we think, oh, we got plenty of time, not only is the clock of Scripture ticking, but our life clock is ticking. You say, I've got plenty of years. I don't know about you, but all you have to do is look at the obituaries and the younger people that are dying today who all thought, I got plenty of time. There's an urgency. Now is the time, the day of salvation. The harvest is plentiful. Laborers are few. Verse 38, look at it. 
Pray that God's people will join him in gathering the harvest of souls before it's too late. That's Jesus' prayer. Here we are. We're talking about Jesus' prayer. So we had the model prayer. We had the prayer for unity. And here's Jesus' prayer. Pray that God's people will gather the souls before it's too late. He's praying that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers out into the harvest. That's what he's praying. Because there's an urgency. There will be a day when it's too late. There will be a day that those that were on that vine that haven't yet been harvested will have no additional chance. You say, is there a need? Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how many of you in the room have a family member or close friend that you know doesn't know Jesus? Is the harvest plentiful? Did you see the number of hands that just went up? That's just in this church, in this room of good, God-fearing, Christ-following people. Look at the number of hands that went up. The harvest is plentiful. Across our community, I don't know what you've seen in our community, but this, it, it ought to shake our church to the core. Why has God put us here? To entertain ourselves? No. To make a difference. I don't know where you go and where, where your, your path takes you, but I'm telling you, mine takes me in areas where I have seen folks that are homeless that used to, you just see them on the corner, now you see where they're living in the, in the side of the road. Now you see where back in the bushes all their stuff is stored. You say, oh, preacher, that's not around here. Why don't you just go down to the end of this street? Take a look. You say, preacher, that's it's not really happening. Oh, no? <laughs> you better think again. It's happening. There are homeless communities all around us. It's only going to get worse. Some of you have heard of the things in our community that have happened this week. There have been, been several different ones. And people stereotype and they go, oh, they're young. They got this. It's drugs. It's whatever. No. The local bank robbery was, a, was an older white guy. It looked like he just needed some money. Could, could he not buy groceries? I don't know. Could, was he having marital problems? I don't know what drove him to make that decision, but I'm telling you, it's not your typical stereotyped person that you would think, oh, yeah, that's all because of this. The world is changing, and the answer is Jesus. Amen. Drive down Dixie Highway. Get down toward Atlantic. There's prostitutes out during the day. Used to be that there was a day and an age where folks would, uh, you know, not do that during the day. That's all day long. Look at the drugs. You're watching people. I don't know, again, if you're seeing it or, or, or I'm the only one seeing it, but look around. You'll watch drug deals literally happening. My wife and I, we just moved back here, pulled into Checkers on Sample Road, and uh, as we're, we're grabbing lunch before we came over to the church, God is my witness, drug deal, right there at Checkers and Sample Road. The car backs in, and they get in, get out, and then they're fighting over, you know, who's going to take it first. It's happening all around us. Talk to people in law enforcement. Talk to people that are engaged in education. Talk to counselors. Talk to people. It's happening across our community. It's happening across, it uh, doesn't matter about skin color. It doesn't matter about economic condition. It doesn't matter if you're poor, if you're rich. It's happening all around us. My emphasis today is this. When Jesus prayed, it wasn't just an issue of saying, hey, that's a nice little prayer. God is good. God is great. Thank you for the food we ate. No, that's not it. Now I lay me down to sleep. No. When Jesus prayed, he was praying for the needs of the people. So here's my question to you. When's the last time you literally, in your prayers, wept over the person you saw street walking? When's the last time you wept over that family that you know that they literally, unless something changes and the drugs are out of that house, that those kids are going to be taken into protective uh, child custody? When's the last time that you wept over these things? I mean, as, as Christ followers, that we were so moved with compassion that we saw the need, that we felt the need, and then we meet the need. That's what God's calling our church to. Jesus' prayers weren't just so we could say, hey, that was a cute little prayer. That was nice. That was neat. That was clean. Ministry's messy. As to lead, uh, uh, we heard last week from Tawana with, with the, the issue of abortion and her story. You see that when people do ministry, it gets messy because you're meeting with people that are 
battling issues of sin? Are you praying that your hands will get messy? Are you praying that God will bring somebody across your path that you can be the hands and feet of Jesus? Are you praying, God, keep me away from that stuff? Are you saying, God, show me how? Give me the resources that I can do something. If nothing more than just respect the person and, and have a conversation to sit down and say, hey, you're in a situation different from mine, but God loves us both. What can I do for you? See, these kind of things are so different than what usually happens. But Jesus' prayer, when we take it and we read the scriptures the way it's written right here, he saw the people, he felt their need, he met their need. What Matthew's doing in this story is really motivating us toward what's called a missional movement. A missional movement. A movement that's on purpose. Something that we do on purpose to proclaim the name of Christ. To uh, answer the, the prayers of these people that are out there saying, God, send me somebody and you're the somebody. To be, again, the hands and feet of Jesus. To be the laborers that are doing his work in this harvest of souls. I said, preacher, that's not what I signed up for. That's, that's different. But aren't we all preachers? Aren't we all called to proclaim the good news? Aren't we all called to share the love of Jesus? Your sphere and circle of influence is going to be different than mine. Those of you that speak different uh, languages, you're going to touch people that I'll never be able to touch because I, I can't communicate with them. Those of you that work in different places, some of you have talked about how the Lord's moved you recently and you're driving to other locations for, for temporary work and maybe God's put you on that mission field for such a time as this. There's somebody there. Maybe he's put you in the area you live because there's somebody there. Maybe he's put you in the health condition that you're in, going to that doctor's office or that dialysis center or whatever it is every day because there's somebody there that you are the person that he's calling to help him reap that harvest. So I want to close with one verse this morning. And it's a, it's a familiar verse. Romans chapter 10, verse 14, it says this. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? What's a preacher? A proclaimer of good news. How are they going to hear unless you tell them? I want us to pause for a moment. And, and, and would you just join me? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? And for just a moment, would you do an inventory of the people in your sphere of influence that might not know Jesus? And a lot of you already raised your hand. You said there's somebody that, that I know that doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior. And as that person comes to your mind this morning, would you just take a moment right now and just pray for them? Specifically pray for that person. God, would you give me the courage? Would you give me the opportunity to reach out to that person? Whoever that one is, and that's been our theme now for months, and it will be through 2023. Who's your one? If you don't have a one already, your one might be that person that just came to your mind. Who's your one? God, give me the courage. Give me the opportunity. Help me to feel their need, to be motivated to the point of meeting their need. As those folks are praying, there are some in the room this morning that maybe you're realizing you're religious. You go to church services. You were raised Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, whatever. Honestly, who cares? Here's the question. In all those years, you've never really known for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. Really, in your heart, you always have that question. When an invitation's given or you talk to somebody, you're saying, well, I hope so. But you're just not sure. What a terrible way to go through life. In the book of 1 John, it says, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. So this morning, if that's you and you're not certain, again, I tell you, pray for laborers to bring in this harvest because there's an urgency. The days or the time is growing late. 
If that's you and you've never made that decision, you, you're putting it off, you're putting it off, you're putting it off. Remember, Scripture teaches us today is the day of salvation. Don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. And if that's you, would you just pray something like this, quietly and silently in your seat. Dear God, today's the day. I finally get it. I can't put it off any longer. I need Jesus as my Savior. I admit that I've done wrong. I confess my sin before you. I understand it's through his blood that was shed on Calvary. On that cross that paid the penalty for my sin. And today, the best way that I know how, I'm inviting you to come into my life and be my Lord, be my Savior today. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to God's family. At the close of the service, I'd love to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you and just, just rejoice with you in, in that decision. But I want to pray for all of us. God, today's a heavy message. It's really different than what we've been going through. Your prayers that we've been looking at, it was how to pray. It was a prayer for unity, and that was heavy for some as well because they've been carrying bitterness. They've allowed it to really take root, and, and that's a hard thing emotionally to try to let that go, to extend forgiveness and to seek reconciliation. That's difficult. But God, today, this is heavy. We're asking people to sense and feel the needs of others that they, they really may not want to. They want to they want to keep that at a distance. They want to live a comfortable life without having to feel guilty or or, or, or really even to feel the needs that others have. And yet, we need to be like you. And so, God, in this, show us what we can do. Help us to sense the needs, to feel these needs, to meet these needs. As a church family, show us the ministries that we need to start or the ministries that we need to beef up or the other local ministries that we can partner with to help meet some of these needs. But God, help us not to each and every week just walk in here in a vacuum, not realizing that you've given us a mission. Help us to leave here today understanding that mission is to go out and to change the world by proclaiming the gospel. I pray you'll give us that courage in Jesus' name. Amen.